Uh, first of all, thank you very much uh, to all of you who are here, especially the Breast Imaging Society of India for helping us put together this program. I'm Dr. Major Bimal Raj. I am a cardiac radiologist uh, from South of India in a city called Bangalore. Uh, Mr. Hari uh, from CHS has been very kind to put this whole program together and support us in this. Uh, my interest has always been in artificial intelligence, and I have collaborated with Mr. Hari on similar projects uh, relating to chest X-ray, et cetera. So that is how I am related to this. The idea was of understanding the space of uh, breast imaging and the role of artificial artificial intelligence, especially taking reference to what is available in India, what is the future, and how we can make the future look better for the Indian images and the patients in this regard. So that is the reason why this program has been put together. And without ado, without any delay, I will request Dr. Smriti Hari. Dr. Smriti, uh, we are really glad to have Dr. Smriti with us. She is an MD radiologist working as a professor in All India Institute of Medical Sciences. She is the general secretary for the Breast Imaging Society of India and is very widely lectured and very well uh, authored in terms of people love to li listen to her. And we are very happy to have you here as one of our faculty members. Uh, over to you, Dr. Smriti, uh, who's going to be talking to us today about breast screening in India, and can artificial intelligence really help with that? Over to you, Dr. Smith. Uh, uh, thank you so much for all the kind words. And uh, I shall now share my screen. Uh, Hari, if you can please make her the co-host. Dr. Manisha, you are the host. At the work. Can you help us to make a host, please? Oh, yeah. Need to be enabled. Uh, Dr. Manisha might be the host right now. If you can please make uh, Dr. Smithy having the be host. Okay, let me see. Um... Okay, Dr. Smithy, can you share your slides now? Uh, yeah, sure. Yes. Uh, are the slides visible now? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So uh, I'm here to uh, try and share what the research till now has shown, uh, what AI can do in the screening process. And uh, let me begin by reiterating that uh, globally, breast cancer is the most common cancer amongst the women in the world, as we can see by the pink color. These are all the countries, including India, where breast cancer is the commonest cancer in women. In the screening scenario, uh, there is that mammography is the only imaging modality that is has been shown in multiple randomized control trials to reduce breast cancer mortality. And the WHO position statement uh, for the well-resourced settings is that women between 50 and 69 should definitely undergo screening at one to three year intervals. In the developed world, we see different protocols uh, ranging from every year annually in US to every three years in the UK. Sweden does it uh, one and a half years uh, in the age range, 40 to 55 years and 56 to 69 years, they increase it to two years. In the low resource settings, the aim has to be to be able to implement the full on uh, population based uh, screening whenever it is possible for them. Uh, after they've built their good health healthcare infrastructure, because this is the only way which will reduce mortality of from breast cancer. So currently, I 
looked up uh, how the world is doing in terms of uh, mammography screening and I came across this nice map from the WHO which shows that the pink is the developed world which is uh, completely under population based screening programs. The blue are the countries like uh, Russia and Brazil and Mexico where the breast cancer screening is uh, is their population base, but it is not entire country is not covered. It is still in pockets. The green are the uh, countries, including India, China, Saudi Arabia, South Africa, where some interest has been shown in mammographic breast screening and some pilot projects have been carried out. And uh, uh, as yet, no, no uh, concerted efforts for population-based screenings. The uh, brown ones are the one, the countries where there has been no effort for uh, breast cancer screening with mammography. They are still at the level of questionnaire-based uh, uh, programs and uh, in trying to increase breast cancer awareness. The white ones are the countries where there is no data available. So what are the hurdles in breast cancer screening with mammography in India? I must say, firstly, our incidence of breast cancer is one fourth of that compared to West. So what that means is that many, many more women will need to be screened to find one cancer and that may not be very cost effective. On the logistic sides, we do not have enough mammography equipments. If I compare the ratio of mammography equipments to physicians who perform a breast examination, it is close to 20% in the US, but less than 0.25% in India. Whatever mammography equipments we have, we, they are not regulated in terms of maintaining quality or even the radiologists who are interpreting mammography, there is no uh, standardized regulations for them and we do not have enough trained breast radiologists. So these are the hurdles for us. And uh, to put things in perspective, uh, the mammography capacity in India as compared to the population is abysmally low. There are only about 3000 uh, uh, computed radiography systems for mammography, only 300 full field digital mammography systems. And the problem with the quality is massive because there is no centralized quality assurance program. And uh, many centers even lack proper test and calibration phantoms. So currently what we are practicing in India is mostly opportunistic screening in urban areas. And we do uh, perform surveillance mammography in breast cancer survivors for the uh, contralateral breast. Uh, and there have been efforts to screen pockets of population with mobile screening units, notably in Chandigarh, the ASHA project, uh, uh, in Uttarakhand and in Kerala, the places that I know of. So even if we go back to the uh, population-based screening programs which are being practiced in the Western world, they have massive challenges. So the topic of today's talk is whether AI can help mitigate some of these challenges. Firstly, the massive number of radiologist hours are being spent on assessing mainly healthy women with normal mammograms. And with double reading practiced in Europe, it further uh, makes the matters worse. So a more efficient method is always being sought which can maintain current cancer detection and recall standards and also cut down on the workforce required for uh, mammography interpretation. So the AI hypothesis has in this regard is that uh, whether AI can predict cancer directly from mammograms with high sensitivity so that we could identify a subset of cancer-free mammograms which need not be read by radiologists. That means we propose AI-based algorithms to be the only reader for a certain subset of uh, mammograms. So this is 
how the workflow would be altered. Currently, all mammograms are read by radiologists who decides which ones need to be recalled and which ones are cancer free. When you have a deep learning uh, based AI model and the workflow will then run like all mammograms will first go through the deep learning model, which will be able to sift out the definitely cancer free mammograms. And then the rest will go to the radiologist who will again recall or call them normal. So to achieve this, first we need to be sure that the performance level of the AI models is comparable to the radiologists in assessing mammograms. And that has been uh, eminently shown in several studies now. This is one of them. Uh, published in 2019. And you can see that in this ROC, the area under curve for the uh, solid line, which is the radiologist performance and the dotted line, which is the AI based model is quite comparable. So that means not only AI can act as a second reader, it could even act as the only reader because it is only then that the, uh, that the work can be reduced for radiologists. So this is a study where uh, a deep learning model could triage 19% of screening mammograms as cancer free and could also improve specificity and the sensitivity was non-inferior to the radiologist assessment. And these are the examples of mammograms which could were triaged as cancer free on the test set. So, the good thing is that this DL model had, it worked very well at all age groups and in all breast densities. Coming to the second important challenge of uh, screening, the high recall rates and the false positives and the inter-reader variability in breast cancer detection and recall rates. Let's see if work has been done to see if AI can help. So this is another great article which is uh, published in the Lancet Digital Health uh, and the group is from uh, South Korea and they have developed and used uh, AI model and this is just a picture to show that this is the input images and while going through the uh, neural network, the output pictures will have a heat map showing you the likely uh, localization of cancer, and it will also have a DL score number going from zero to one. And in using this uh, technique, they studied 320 mammograms, which were enriched with cancer, 160 were cancer positive. And each mammogram was assessed by 14 radiologists in terms of likelihood of malignancy, location of malignancy and necessity to recall the patient first without and then with the assistance of the AI algorithm. And then the performance was evaluated in terms of ROC. So the performance level of AI was significantly higher than uh, that of the radiologist without AI assistance. With the assistance of AI, radiologist performance was improved from uh, 0.81 to 0.88 area under curve. And it was found that AI was more sensitive than radiologists to detect cancers, uh, whether they were like masses or like architectural distortions and asymmetries. And AI was better in detection of early cancer, T1 cancers or node negative cancers. So coming to the third challenge for breast cancer screening is the relatively large proportion of women whose cancer is not detected during screening, despite their regular participation in the screening program. And these cancers we know as the interval cancers. So to avoid getting this, uh, these interval cancers, we need to identify the women at highest risk of leaving screening facilities with undetected cancer. And there has been a very, very interesting study by Dem Brower et al. Uh, uh, this is a group from uh, Stockholm, Sweden, and they have 
studied 6,817 healthy women and 547 women with breast cancer. And they used an AI cancer detector algorithm by Lunit, South Korea, which was trained on 17 lakhs mammogram with cancer and 13 lakh mammograms of healthy controls. The generated AI score for tumor presence is a decimal number between zero and one where one represents the highest level of suspicion. It is very, very interesting to see how they uh, plan to use this, uh, uh, this AI algorithm in a simulated workflow. So first, the cohort would undergo the, um, uh, the algorithm would for an AI score rule out, that is, if there are 100 mammograms, the lowest 60 mammograms with the lowest scores were assumed to be cancer-free. So they do not require any radiologist, the lowest AI scores. Uh, so, yeah, so 60% of the mammograms do not require any radiologists. So that means we are reducing the workload of radiologists by half. Then the 40 mammograms which are left, they are read by the radiologists. There is double reading and consensus out of which 3% abnormal mammograms go for a diagnostic workup. What about the 37 normal mammograms, the so-called normal mammograms, you again put them through the uh, algorithm and there is an AI score rule in now. That is, you pick up the two to 5% mammogram with highest AI scores, which means they have a high likelihood of uh, presence of malignancy, even though the radiologist reading is negative and you could then subject them to a supplemental modality like MRI and what would happen? You would be able to pick up some cancers with which would show abnormal MRI and which could be picked up, even though the, uh, the reading by the radiologist was negative. So when they simulated this uh, workflow and created two workflows, one was the no radiologist uh, work stream, the AI cancer detector algorithm did not miss any cancer that would otherwise have been screen detected. And within the enhanced assessment work stream, where after a negative double reading among the women with the highest 2% AI scores, there was a potential additional cancer detection rate of 71 per thousand examinations, which is phenomenal. And we believe that these cancers would be the one which would present either as interval cancers or at the next screening round. So this is a very, very interesting uh, study by, and now we come to the next uh, challenge, which is that we are not really practicing any individual uh, level uh, screening. It is not optimized for individuals. What we are doing is a one size fits all approach. That is because we do not have very reliable risk stratification in which we could select women who should be offered MRI or for whom the screening program should be adapted in other ways. The available breast cancer risk prediction models are mostly questionnaire based, which take into account the epidemiological risk factors. The image based prediction models till now have been the mammographic density based models. So the, the, the hope is that AI based prediction models would come up and would be robust and better than mammographic density based models. And a lot of studies have been done uh, in this regard because it is believed that mammographic images contain indicators of risk which are not captured with use of breast density alone. And perhaps these uh, indicators are beyond the limits of human detection, which could be discovered by AI deep learning. 
So I will again go to this uh, study again by Dem Brower et al, who tested this hypothesis on uh, 2283 women, more than 2000 women, 270 or eight of whom were subsequently diagnosed with breast cancer. So uh, they found that the DL risk score, uh, the degree of correlation with two density-based measurements made by automated software was found to be low to moderate. That suggests that the DL risk score is not simply a proxy for breast density, but it is picking up something more. And it was found that the deep neural network showed a higher risk association for breast cancer compared with the best mammographic density models available with a better diagnostic performance. And the false negative rate was lower for the deep neural network than for the mammographic density based models. And the difference is more pronounced in women who are later diagnosed with aggressive node positive cancers. So it, would, it was concluded in this study that compared with density-based models, a deep neural network can be more accurate in predicting which women are at risk for future breast cancer with a lower false negative rate for more aggressive cancers. So to uh, conclude, I will again like to reiterate how AI can help in the process of screening is firstly, now robust AI algorithms are commercially available and they have been widely validated and can be used as effective diagnostic support tool for radiologists in mammography interpretation. If you use low AI scores to triage mammograms into no radiologist assessments, you could potentially reduce radiologist workload by more than half without indenting the sensitivity of the uh, workflow. And after regular radiologist assessment of the remainder, AI can select the women with the highest 2% AI scores for more sensitive screening, which will promote early detection of cancers, which would otherwise be diagnosed as interval cancers. And lastly, image-based TL models offer promise as more accurate predictors of breast cancer risk than density-based models and existing epidemiology-based models. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you, Dr. Hari. Uh, that was really good and a very nice overview of what is the current challenge and what could be the potential uses of uh, AI in screening of uh, mammography in India. If I could just ask you to make Dr. Manisha the host, sure. uh, in that, that would be great. Uh, and I take this opportunity to actually introduce uh, Dr. Rupa Anand. She is a uh, consultant radiologist who specializes in breast imaging, including complex breast interventions and women's imaging. She uh, works in Manipal Hospital in Bangalore, is a life member of the IRIA, the Breast Imaging Society of India, also the Royal College of India. She has the distinction of being awarded the best paper from the European Congress of Radiology and has been uh, instrumental in organizing the National Conference of Breast Imaging from the Imaging and Breast Imaging Society of India. Uh, it is a great pleasure to have you here, Dr. Uh, Rupa, and I hand over the proceedings to you to take it further. Oh, thank you. Uh, good evening. Uh, sorry for being a late, Kate. I was, I'm really technologically challenged and uh, this was my Achilles heel today, so that's why I'm late in joining. Uh, and I'm really, uh, I'd like to welcome all of you here for this uh, short, very interesting uh, 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 debate come lecture series, which we're having on uh, AI and breast imaging. And uh, Smriti, uh, I was supposed to introduce you. I'm really sorry, I was not there to do that. Uh, but uh, I heard the uh, tail end of your uh, a lecture and it's, it's, it's really wonderful to hear how much uh, you've gone into depth about uh, the role of AI in breast imaging. And uh, since we have a few minutes before we start the next uh, speaker, can I ask you a question, Smriti? Yes, sure. Yeah, what I would like to ask is uh, uh, how, how much do you think uh, AI 
will it replace CAD or uh, do you think it sort of uh, it, it's, it plays a completely different role? Uh, CAD has been mostly a flop show. Okay. So okay. because CAD uh, had so many false positives and in fact, it increased the reading time. So uh, AI has a, is a different level altogether. Yeah. And uh, when we say that AI can not only be used as the second reader, which of course is a, is a very plausible role, it can even be used as a single reader. Okay. Because what we are seeing is that the sensitivity and specificity reached with AI alone is pretty high. So uh, CAD is no match to AI and I envisage a good role for uh, AI. I mean, a great role for AI in mammography interpretation. Yes, thank you. And that was the second thing I wanted to ask you. Do you think uh, AI will serve as a double reader, especially when in countries like, uh, uh, you know, where you have a dearth of radiologists who can sure, actually sure, detect the sure, sure, sure. So it should. Do you think it will replace us? I mean, is that is that no, what you no, it no. cannot replace us mm -hmm. uh, because we even if we are using it as a single reader, we'll have to kind of keep a check on it. Absolutely. Uh, because it's a technology after all, and uh, we like to make, uh, we'll have to make double checks on what it is reporting. And we have to be sure that we don't lose our acumen because uh, at any time, if the system is not working, we are back to ourselves. Yes. So it's not going to replace us, but it's going to have a place where it is helpful to us and takes a little anxiety off us of missing cancers. Yes, exactly. So I think it, it's an aid, isn't it? It'll aid us. But yes, it is. And aid. I actually, uh, you know, just interestingly, I can't remember the paper, but uh, I, 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 there was a paper which actually uh, looked at how ladies felt, uh, women felt about uh, AI reading. And they most of them said they didn't want the AI alone reading yes. their mammogram. Yes, They're I happy. came across the paper where they would be very cagey if it was only the computer reading the mammograms. Uh, yes. Most of the women are okay with AI as the second reader, mm -hmm. but uh, not with only AI. Yes, yes. So I think that, that's an important thing to uh, look at, isn't it? Yeah. yeah so, I, would, I would just like to share a, a thought uh, of a great idea which Kritika has uh, for using AI genuinely for uh, the possibility of screening in India, for which we are looking for partners to, you know, see. She has an idea that we could use uh, the normal X-ray machines to perform mm -hmm. mammograms with the addition of just the compression uh, paddles and with the lowest KV possible, which is around 40 KV. And then the acquired images would go through the AI algorithm to produce mammogram-like images. Oh, that's very interesting. Okay. So it's such yeah. an interesting proposal. Mm -hmm. uh, and the only thing is we need to find the uh, industry partners who are willing to test it and try it. And that would be something if this comes through and then we would say, yes, uh, India can have more more screening uh, yeah, capability. Exactly. Exactly. If we could yeah. convert our normal X-ray machines uh, with that, the help yes. of AI. Absolutely, absolutely. Yes, yes. So that's really nice uh, hearing from you, Smithy. Uh, your thoughts, yeah, and you know the wonderful ideas which are you know sort of coming out ah, of those thoughts. Yeah. That's great. Amazing. Yes. It's an amazing. Right. Thank you, uh, Thank you once again. Thank you. And uh, now I have uh, a, great, a great pleasure to uh, introduce our next uh, speaker. Uh, Dr. Manisha Bal uh, is a radiologist from the Massachusetts General Hospital and Harvard Medical School. And we are honored to have her here today. She's the past director of the Breast Imaging Fellowship Program in that institute. She was a graduate, she's a graduate from Stanford University. Uh, and Harvard School of Public Health. She completed her residency and fellowship training at Duke University Medical Center, and most recently also completed a, a professional certificate in machine learning and AI at MIT. So she's got a wonderful uh, 
combination of radiology and actual training in AI. She has won numerous awards for her research, including the American Rongen Ray Society Award. She is the associate editor for the Journal of Breast Imaging and has been recently selected to be an associate editor for radiology for artificial intelligence. So uh, without much uh, ado, I uh, now welcome Dr. Manisha. Uh, those of us who have uh, uh, our in circles of uh, AI and uh, breast imaging have uh, seen her wonderful work. So I welcome you, Dr. Manisha, to start your lecture. We're really looking forward to it. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for that kind introduction, uh, Dr. Rupa, and for this opportunity. I would like to thank Dr. Kritika and Dr. Smriti for the invitation to speak today. I am a breast imaging radiologist at the Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston, and it is such an honor for me to be part of this seminar on AI. The topic of my presentation is AI and breast imaging, past, present, and future. I will begin by briefly reviewing the history of breast imaging and the introduction of computer-aided detection in the late 1990s. We will then discuss the currently approved AI algorithms in the domains of density assessment, triage, and lesion detection and diagnosis. In the last section, we will discuss future non-interpretive AI applications, including risk assessment, imaging controls, and workflow optimization. AI for breast MRI is also an active area of research that we will briefly discuss. The practice of breast imaging has transitioned through a variety of technological advances. This is an example of a very early breast radiograph from the 1930s using standard X-ray equipment of the time. Since then, mammographic technology has markedly advanced. This is a comparison of negative mammograms with dense breast tissue from 1965 to the present. The first image is an example of a direct exposure film mammogram without compression. The next is a zero mammogram. Next is a screen film mammogram. And the last image is a full field digital mammogram. We are now in the midst of another technological advance for breast imaging, that of computer-aided detection, CAD, and AI. CAD is a generic term that refers to computers assisting radiologists to identify a potentially significant finding on an image. It is not a new concept in breast imaging. From the late 1980s to the late 1990s, efforts were made to quantitatively analyze mammographic images to identify suspicious lesions. And in 1998, the Food and Drug Administration, or FDA, in the United States approved the first commercial CAD system, Image Checker M1000 from Hologic. In 2002, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, or C CMS, in the United States increased reimbursement for CAD use, and CAD was then widely adopted by the breast imaging community. Despite the early promise of improved performance, subsequent research has shown that traditional CAD does not improve any metric of screening performance, including sensitivity, specificity, and cancer detection rate. One of the primary limitations of CAD is its high false positive rate. With this high rate of false alarms, it is likely that radiologists have learned to largely ignore the CAD markings. These early versions of CAD use a human-driven, rule-based mathematical model approach that can't improve with additional inputs. Recent advances in AI and ML, such as deep learning based neural networks have opened up a new line of techniques for CAD that offer advantages over prior approaches. While traditional CAD relies on human engineered features based on radiologists knowledge and experience, deep learning algorithms learn the features that are necessary to classify the mammographic images as positive or negative improve with exposure to more data, and have the potential to discover features and relationships that are currently unknown or imperceptible to humans. 
AI and breast imaging has quickly progressed from pilot and feasibility studies to clinical implementation. In the United States, there are currently 18 commercial AI algorithms that have been approved by the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration. Eight of the 18 approved applications are intended for density assessment on mammography and are listed on this slide. Three of the approved applications are intended for triage on mammography. For example, CM Triage is a software workflow tool designed to aid radiologists in prioritizing exams within a work list for compatible full field digital mammographic screening exams. CM Triage flags cases that have at least one suspicious finding, and these flags are viewed by the radiologist via the PAX work list. CM triage is intended for passive notification only and does not provide any diagnostic information beyond triage and prioritization. Thus, it is not intended to replace the review of images or be used as a standalone um, decision maker for clinical decision making. One of the approved triage algorithms, Sage Q, can also be applied to tomosynthesis exams. Four of the approved applications are intended for lesion detection and diagnosis on mammography, in which the algorithm identifies the finding and offers a prediction of malignancy risk. Three of the applications are intended for lesion diagnosis only on ultrasound and MRI. For the lesion diagnosis only applications, the, the user must identify and select the finding first. The AI algorithm then classifies it or offers a prediction of malignancy risk. We will next discuss three examples of FDA approved applications, starting with Transpera. Transpera is an FDA approved deep learning based AI application for lesion detection and diagnosis on mammography. It provides radiologists with certain decision support tools, including traditional lesion markers, local cancer likelihood scores activated by clicking on specific areas, and a cancer likelihood score based on the entire exam. In a multi-reader study, investigators compared the cancer detection performance of 14 radiologists interpreting 240 digital mammograms with and without the support of Transpera. This is an imaging example from the article. These are mammographic images from a 71-year-old woman with an invasive ductal cancer. The abnormality, the cancer, is circled by the AI system with a level of suspicion score also assigned by the AI system. Without the AI system, only four of 14 radiologists recall this patient for further imaging. With the AI system, 11 of 14 radiologists appropriately recall the patient. The authors found that radiologist performance was better with the AI system as measured by the AUC, but this improvement was observed with less experienced radiologists and not with expert radiologists. Sensitivity increased with AI support and specificity trended toward improvement. Reading time per case was similar with and without AI. In a subsequent study with the same AI system that Dr. Smriti previously discussed, the investigators reported that the standalone performance of the AI system was non-inferior to that of the radiologists. These results suggest that this AI system could serve as a standalone first or second reader in screening programs, and that it could help radiologists with varying levels of training and experience achieve performance benchmarks. Although this AI system performs well, It uh, potentially could be strengthened if it com incorporated comparisons to patients' prior examinations. Currently, there is only one FDA-approved algorithm for breast MRI, 
quant X, which is in the domain of lesion diagnosis. Breast MRI is the most sensitive imaging modality for the detection of breast cancer, but specificity of MRI is only moderate. The purpose of quant X is to improve specificity by distinguishing between cancerous and non-cancerous lesions. Quantex includes image registration and automated lesion segmentation initiated from a seed point indicated by the user. This image is a screenshot of the AI system user interface showing that an enhancing mass is segmented in the top two images based on the seed point placed by the radiologist reader in the bottom two images. For that lesion, the AI system then generates a list of key features, including time to peak, variance, curve shape index, washout rate, and texture. In addition, the AI system generates a single value known as the quant X score, which is related to the likelihood of cancer. In a recent reader study published in the journal Radiology, 19 breast imaging radiologists from academic and private practices interpreted 111 breast MRI exams with and without the use of quant X. With regard to distinguishing cancers from non-cancerous lesions, the standalone performance of the AI system based on reader-selected seed points yielded a mean AUC of 0.71, which is represented by the green curve. Without the use of the AI system, the mean AUC for radiologist reader performance was also 0.71, which is in blue. With use of the AI system, the average AUC of readers improved from 0.71 to 0.76, which is in red. The authors concluded that the use of an AI system improves radiologist performance in the task of distinguishing between cancerous and non-cancerous lesions. It is important to note, however, that this particular AI system could help radiologists reduce classification errors, but not detection errors, because the radiologist must first identify the lesion to make use of the AI system. An additional limitation of this study in all reader studies is that the behavior of radiologists in a reader study may differ from actual clinical practice. Factors that could impact clinical practice include a radiologist's level of confidence in his or her independent interpretation, level of confidence in the performance of the AI system, the interpretability of the AI system, that is the rationale being used to guide its predictions, and the user friendliness of the AI system. The last FDA-approved AI application that we will discuss is Kios DS, which is a lesion diagnosis application for ultrasound. Kios DS automatically generates a probability of malignancy for a user-selected ROI that contains a breast lesion. The probability is then mapped into four categories, benign, probably benign, suspicious, or probably malignant. In this example, orthogonal ultrasound transverse and sagittal images of a breast mass are shown on the left. Kios DS output scores are presented as an electronic case report in conjunction with the images. The system classified this mass as suspicious with the triangle marker indicating confidence of assessment within that category. In this example, the system correctly classified the mass as suspicious, which was confirmed to be an invasive ductal cancer by ultrasound guided biopsy. In a study validating this application, 15 physicians, including 11 radiologists, interpreted 900 breast lesions on ultrasound with and without support of this AI tool. The mean reader AUC for cases reviewed with ultrasound only was 0.83. For cases reviewed with ultrasound plus AI support, mean AUC was 0.87. 14 readers achieved a better AUC with AI support than without it. Use of the AI algorithm also led to decreased inter-reader and intra-reader variability. 
the authors concluded that this system improved correct assessment of sonographic breast lesions by most physicians while reducing inter and intra observer variability. With regard to implementation of AI in clinical practice, the first step is ensuring that the algorithm works with appropriate approvals from regulatory agencies such as the FDA. In addition, it is necessary to help the user understand how it works and to integrate it into the workflow. Even an accurate and trusted AI system will fail if it does not perform well within the context of the clinical workflow and the human computer interaction. These systems must be designed so that radiologists and machines solve tasks jointly and their evaluation should depend on the success of the machine as a tool in the larger process. We will next discuss the future of AI and breast imaging. This table lists potential applications of AI and breast imaging, which includes both interpretive and non-interpretive AI. Interpretive AI includes density assessment, triage, and lesion detection and diagnosis. As we discussed, there are existing commercial algorithms in each of these domains. In the future, there will likely be commercial algorithms for non-interpretive AI applications, including risk assessment, imaging control, such as scan acquisition and reconstruction, and workflow optimization. I will briefly discuss each of these non-interpretive AI applications. With regard to risk assessment, Accurate assessment of an individual's women's risk can help guide personalized screening regimens and prevention strategies. Traditional risk models incorporate patient-specific characteristics such as age, family history, and hormonal and reproductive risk factors. More recently, mammographic breast density has also been added to risk prediction models. Density alone, however, fails to capture the rich information contained within a mammographic image. Recent studies have shown that deep learning models based on mammographic images can improve breast cancer risk prediction. Performance of these deep learning based models improves further still when combined with traditional risk factor information such as patient age and family history. The next potential application of AI is imaging controls. Applying AI to the image acquisition process can improve image quality, process efficiency, and technologist performance. For example, deep learning algorithms that automatically assess image quality could be built into the image acquisition process. That is, blur and or positioning problems can be detected while the patient is still in the room. With regard to workflow optimization, AI is being used in emergency radiology to prioritize studies with urgent findings, such as pulmonary embolism and intracranial hemorrhage. This approach to organizing and prioritizing exams could be used for breast imaging also. Exams classified as normal by the AI algorithm could be overread very quickly to give the patient immediate results. Exams flagged with probable abnormalities could be prioritized for immediate diagnostic evaluation or could be concentrated for radiologist review. Most of the FDA approved applications are intended for mammography. Currently, there's only one FDA approved application for breast MRI, which we discussed, but AI for MRI is an active area of research. Future directions in the domain of AI and breast MRI include decreasing scan time by using AI in MRI acquisition and reconstruction techniques, expanding the use of non-contrast MRI, improving personalized risk assessment with back to therapy, and prediction of patient outcome for individualized treatment planning. With regard to challenges faced with MRI, available training data sets for MRI are relatively small as compared to those available for digital mammography. A second challenge is a lack of standardization with regard to segmentation, feature extraction, and feature selection for MRI. 
The goal of any new technology is to provide value. And these commercial AI algorithms will need to demonstrate value through increased efficiency, improved quality, reduced costs, and increased revenues. With regard to efficiency, AI systems could auto-categorize breast density, identify abnormalities, and pre-populate reports. AI systems could also reduce screening workload by auto-reporting normal exams. With regard to quality, AI systems will need to demonstrate their contribution to decreased false positive rates and increased cancer detection rates. With regard to cost savings and revenue generation, if financial incentives are introduced to encourage use of AI, such as when an additional charge for use of traditional CAD was introduced, then we can expect widespread adoption of AI technology. In closing, Breast imaging has a rich history of technological advances from direct exposure film mammography to zero mammography to screen film mammography, and more recently to digital mammography and tomosynthesis. The development and implementation of AI algorithms into breast imaging practices is yet another technological advance that will hopefully improve our quality and efficiency, which traditional CAD has failed to do. There are currently 18 FDA-approved AI algorithms in the United States in the domains of density assessment and diagnosis. In the future, there will likely be commercial algorithms for non-interpretive AI applications, including risk assessment, imaging controls, and workflow optimization. There is currently only one commercial algorithm for breast MRI, but AI for MRI is a very active area of research. The goal of any new technology is to provide value and AI algorithms will need to demonstrate value through the standard metrics of increased efficiency, improved quality, reduced costs and increased revenues. That concludes my presentation. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, uh, Dr. Manisha, as always. That was a very, very nice and a very thought provoking uh, uh, lecture. And I think that's, that's important to know what the future is and to see the future in the present. And I think you've given us a glimpse of that. Thank you very much. Can you take one question? Uh, can you take a question here? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is a question coming in from one of our readers and they want to know whether AI is being used as a reader, either a first reader or a second reader in your institute right now? Uh, currently at my institution, we continue to use traditional CAD, which hasn't been shown to improve diagnostic accuracy. Um, we are using a AI-based density algorithm in our practice. Um, of course, the radiologist can override the assessment given by the algorithm that, that that is available to us. I think eventually we will adopt um, an AI-based CAD as I think many breast imaging practices will. One of the limitations is that um, most of the AI-based CAD uh, programs are currently available for 2D mammography. But since we are a 100 tomosynthesis institution, um, we are awaiting, uh, you know, commercial tomosynthesis application that is, you know, accurate and robust. Uh, we've had a number of, uh, you know, uh, uh, comments on the chat, uh, you know, uh, congratulating you on your excellent presentation and making something so complex seem so simple. Uh, I just, I just like to ask you a question. Uh, uh, do you, uh, do you envisage that later our reports uh, of mammography would include both the interpretive and the non-interpretive uh, 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 portions of the AI? Like would, like, would we be saying that the AI suggests that you have so much risk or, you know, things like that? Would that be the future? Yeah, I think that's um, an interesting direction for AI to go with regard to non-interpretive applications like risk assessment which is an active area of research, I think that will help guide, um, that will help guide personalized screening regimens and prevention strategies. 
you know, currently in our reports, we do give um, a lifetime risk estimate score that isn't AI based, but it's based on, you know, traditional models like the Tarakuzic model and Gale. And basically, if that risk is higher than 20%, we recommend MRI, you know, in addition to screening, in, in addition to yearly screening mammography. Um, so in the future, once there are, you know, robust risk assessment models, it's possible that the um, instead of just reporting, you know, the risk based on the traditional epidemiological models, it'll also incorporate risk based on the on the images. But um, as of yet, there aren't um, any currently available commercial, you know, tools for risk assessment. But I do think that'll be a, a big part of risk assessment in the future. Yes, thank you. Uh, there's just one question. Probably I can put it on your thing. That's. Uh, are there any AI courses for uh, breast radiologists that somebody is very interested uh, after your talk? I mean, maybe I can just pass on your email and they could uh, talk to you about that. Yes, yes. Please feel free to contact me. Um, there are a lot of, uh, there are a number of online courses available now requiring less, you know, in-person presence, which I think is challenging these days. But um, I am aware of MIT and Stanford offering online programs that are, you know, that are well known for, for actually it's not, some of them are more geared toward healthcare professionals. Um, I'm not aware of any specifically geared for breast imaging radiologists, but I think the concepts um, and uh, terminology is, is, is important to learn. Yeah. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Uh, as always, it's been a great pleasure. Uh, I would hope you just stay on for about 15 minutes because we're just having a short talk tonight now and then we have panel discussion. And we'd really like to hear your views and a lot of questions which people have. Thank you. Thank you once again. Right. And, uh, and now I have uh, great pleasure in introducing our next speaker, uh, Kritika Rangarajan is, uh, has finished her uh, radiology from uh, the prestigious All India Institute of Medical Science. And uh, she was actually uh, a student of uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Smriti. And now she's taken this wonderful uh, uh, path of doing her a post, and she's now a postdoctoral fellow from the Indian Institute of Technology in Delhi in AI. Okay, so uh, let's hear what uh, Kritika has to tell us about AI and breast imaging, particularly from the uh, Indian context. Over to you, Kritika. Thank you very much. Thank you for that kind introduction. Uh, Dr. Manisha, would you be able to make me the host, please? I'm not able to share my screen at the moment. Hi, Dr. Kritika. Yes, I just, I just did. Are you able to okay. now? As well. Okay, thank oh, you. I'm, I'm able to, thank you. So uh, thank you very much for that kind introduction. And I'm here to speak about um, AI and breast imaging and should radiologists really fear it, um, hype, separating hype from reality. So um, as we begin uh, discussing this, uh, I'm gonna begin with uh, what we call the Gartner's hype cycle. So this is what typically happens with any new technology when it's introduced there is an initial peak of inflated expectations where we really believe that this technology is going to change everything that we do. And then there is a trough of disillusionment where we suddenly start seeing the negatives of the technology and we believe that, uh, that, that there is really nothing that this technology can achieve. And slowly there is a slope of enlightenment and then we get to the plateau of productivity. So my aim in this talk is really to try to identify what this plateau of productivity may look like um, as far as AI in breast imaging is concerned. And let's start with some examples from radiology itself and specifically from breast radiology. Uh, much talked about in both the, both the talks before me, uh, we come to, we first discuss traditional computer aided detection. There was of course an initial um, extreme enthusiasm about 
CAD. CAD got its FDA approval, uh, just like Dr. Manisha had mentioned in 1998. Um, and then there was so much enthusiasm at the beginning where it was believed that it can increase cancer detection rates. It was believed that we can start detecting cancers earlier um, than they would otherwise be detected uh, with the use of CAD. But later, larger studies actually established that it neither improved the sensitivity nor improved the specificity of detection. It, in fact, ended up adding to the cost without actually improving the ROC characteristics of radiologists who are trying to interpret it. Um, so the plateau of productivity really is, is as Dr. Smithy rightly put it, um, just a flop show as far as CAD is concerned. Um, now let's look at this similarly for, say, MRI. Um, there was all there was of course a peak of inflated expectations as soon as MR came in we realized that the images were so clear and so easy to interpret and so easy to see that maybe radiologists would no longer really be needed to interpret these images um, so 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 we um, soon however reached a trough of disillusionment where we realized that we now can see so much with MR that we barely knew what to do with these lesions uh, despite actually end ending up seeing so many lesions. And eventually we've come to a plateau of productivity where we know where to, or at least we're trying to figure out whom to recommend MR for and how it can be optimally utilized so that it can actually improve the productivity and improve the patient experience. Um, so what is this with artificial intelligence? Uh, 2016 was when George Hin Hinton um, famously said, that it's very obvious now that we should stop training radiologists. Uh, and this is something that perhaps radiologists haven't realized, but um, it's, it's obvious that their task can be much better performed by computers. I think we've settled into a much more measured kind of uh, expectation out of CAD, where what is famously said again is the popular epithet that's, that goes that radiologists using AI would replace radiologists who do not use AI. So, Let's try to understand my job over the next 20 minutes is to try to understand why and what role we have to play as a radiologist. So um, I would try and discuss this in terms of how technically is traditional CAD different from the current generation of artificial intelligence that we offer? Where do we stand as breast radiologists now in this new changed world? And do we really have to have a role to play even in the development uh, is what I'm going to try to discuss. So CAD actually is a form of traditional software engineering. Um, what this is, is a rule-based programming where there would be a programmer who gives a simple rule to the system. And this rule gets built into the, uh, into the computer. And the computer is expected to apply this rule when it's given a new input and produce a result. So if we were to look at this in very simple terms, if the rule was that Y is X into two, the computer would simply compute this and give you the output. Uh, in case of traditional CAD, this was certain density characteristics. We could try to model um, certain features of the image and try to teach the computer to really pick up abnormalities that we do as humans. Uh, contrast this with AI. AI is entirely data-driven, and that's the major difference between what we use as AI in today's day and what we were using as computer-aided detection previously. So AI is given a set of data uh, and in the same case, if we were to extend this example, AI is given a set of uh, data, which may say that, you know, a set of X's and Y's, and uh, we would give it a probable, so it would try to derive a probable rule out of it. So if this was the data, it would derive that perhaps the rule is X is, sorry, Y is X into two, and then compute an output. So essentially AI is learning completely from the data that you give it, rather than trying to learn um, uh, rather than trying to um, actually emulate some, some rule that you are feeding into it. So this is the training data that we talk about. So we, we allow it to learn from, the cert from certain training data that we give to AI. So why then can AI go wrong? After all, it is learning from the data that we provide it, right? So we can think of AI as being a very powerful mathematical representation of the problem. For example, if you were to represent the image in a mathematical way, then you could think of it loosely as AI is in some sense uh, deriving uh, a mathematical equation which may try to predict the uh, presence of cancer. So, so the problem here though, is that when data is complex, it's very hard to say what AI is predicting, which is why we call it a black box algorithm. 
Uh, we don't know what's going on inside this complex mathematical equation and why it's making a choice that it is. And this heavily depends on how you've trained your system. To give a very simplistic example, for instance, if we were to try to detect malignancy from, uh, from mammograms, and let's say that our training set had only screen-full mammograms, we'd given, um, uh, sorry, the training set had, tra had screen-full mammograms for all the benign or the normal cases. However, all our, our, when we collected the data, we collected it in such a way that we got the cancers from um, FFDM systems. Then all that the system may try to do is it may try to differentiate a screen film system from a digital mammogram. And this would actually be enough for it to get an excellent accuracy. Now, while this is an example which is relatively easy to see, easy to spot, um, a lot of data biases may be very hard to spot, um, which is why we may not actually end up detecting what we actually intend to detect. Uh, so AI is, of course, a very powerful mathematical tool. It's learned from data, much like we learn from data during our residency. In fact, it's capable of learning from lots and lots of data from a very short span of time. For example, the Google AI mammography tool actually learned from mammograms of 1,37,291 women. And imagine the amount of time it would take any of us as residents to, to see. It would take us a lifetime to see these many mammograms. Um, uh, and, and AI would, the, the network would probably train in maybe a matter of a few days. So, uh, however, much like our imaging modalities suffer from certain artifacts, uh, like you have artifacts on MR, artifacts on CT, which we are trained to detect and understand, AI does suffer from a lot of data biases, which is what we perhaps need to train ourselves to understand. And as radiologists, we are the subject matter experts who can actually help in identifying and removing these biases go during the uh, course of training or uh, during the course of development of the algorithm, as well as use of the um, AI. So um, where do we stand as breast radiologists in this era of AI? Uh, so, so why is a human really needed in the cockpit? We spoke a lot about, can we actually allow AI to move? Uh, it, it shows excellent accuracies. Most studies actually show that uh, in terms of accuracy, it performs way better than human radiologists at times. So why is a human needed at all in the cockpit? And does this human necessarily need to be a radiologist? Why not just have a breast surgeon? Why not install it in say the breast clinic itself where you can have a surgeon or a physician actually using um, AI? And um, are we now only reduced to with AI? Are we only just watching over AI? Now to explain this, um, this, is, this is the video of um, a self-driving car, the, the famous Uber self-driving car accident. Um, so if we look at this, for example, we can clearly see the pedestrian. So the human eye can clearly see the pedestrian. However, AI did not even ask the car to slow down in this case. So what I want to emphasize on at this point is that when it comes to dealing with human lives, uh, uh, the, the question goes beyond numbers. So AI may actually do better than humans. Self-driving may do better than humans in terms of the number of accidents produced. But an accident which is very obvious to a human eye is not acceptable when it comes to dealing with lives. And, and that is one of the major reasons why, um, why it's important to have a human in the cockpit because mistakes that AI makes are not usually the same as mistakes that human beings make. Um, another reason is the lack of explainability. This is an example from our own work in uh, COVID pneumonia. What we found when we were trying to train AI for uh, detecting COVID on X-ray was that uh, while, while AI was able to, of course, do it very well, uh, we also saw that um, in, in patients who had completely normal radiographs, AI had a 92% accuracy in detecting COVID versus non-COVID which is something we could not explain even retrospectively. We did note that the uh, attention of the network was um, around the cardiac region, but there was no way for us to explain why this was happening, which becomes a very important barrier when we actually have to implement it clinically, which is the reason why we've never managed to implement um, even such a potentially useful tool in actual clinical practice. So uh, the, the, the solution to this is that there has to be a human expert in the cockpit in order to really uh, take things forward. 
So coming to the second question, which is why does this human really have to be a, a radiologist? Why can't it be just a breast surgeon, for instance? Um, the, the answer to this is that we are working with an expert system. And if we are going to keep a check on an expert system, you need an expert who is um, very good at doing that job. So how does a breast surgeon sort out diagnostic dilemmas without the experience that a radiologist really has? Um, which again brings us to another question, which is that now let's assume that the plummeting workflows, uh, because a lot of things can be triaged by, by uh, AI itself. So doesn't that really decrease our workloads and doesn't that make radiology a lot less lucrative now? Uh, this is a graph that I've taken from um, an article published in 2020, which shows how dramatically our workloads have increased. And this is only showing numbers in terms of number of imaging, um, imaging modalities that have been performed. Uh, but think about the fact that these are not just single x-rays. These are not just single images, but these are usually cross-sectional imaging that we're looking at. So, so imagine the number of images that you're seeing every single day and the amount yeah. of stress that radiologists are under uh, to ensure that you're not actually missing out on anything. I would argue that that, that radiology perhaps needs AI more than AI needs radiology. We all need some help um, in ensuring that we are doing our clinical work pro uh, properly. So let me in fact take um, a contrary viewpoint and actually go on to say that this is actually perhaps providing us with an opportunity. Think about the situation in India. We have one radiologist for 100,000 population. And breast screening is clearly not possible, as uh, Professor Smriti Hari very nicely explained in her first presentation. So is there an opportunity in terms of actually enabling screen, screening programs? And can it actually improve the number of the quality of the studies that we as radiologists are seeing? Perhaps if we see 50 mammograms a day, maybe we can ensure that the 50 that we see have a very high likelihood of cancer rather than uh, rather than actually seeing everything. And that makes it possible to screen maybe double the, the population that we are currently doing. So uh, another very common reason given for why AI is not going to replace the radiologist is who takes the blame when something goes wrong. Usually if there is a cancer missed, there is a radiologist who we can say that, um, uh, that, that this is the per person who missed it. And there can be a legal proceeding against him. But who would take the blame when it comes to AI? Would the company who developed it really take the blame? Would the radiologist who was overseeing it take the blame? Uh, but actually that interestingly also, come, uh, also brings up another question of, are you then reduced only to a signatory authority who is there only to take the blame when things go wrong? And herein, I would introduce the problem of MR again. Uh, in the 1990s and early years of clinical use of MRI, it was widely believed that the images being so clear, radiologists would really no longer be needed. And think about this 30 years later, the complexity of the field that MRI, uh, the complexity that of the images that MRI offers actually has made the entry into um, radiology far more formidable than it was. And I think the lesson we've learned from this is that the more data there is, the more complexity gets created and there is need for more expertise and not less. So in fact, what a radiology report of the future may look like is something like this. There is, of course, a description of the finding, which is something that we routinely give. But there would also be some radiomic features that we give. There would perhaps be a molecular analysis that we give. We'll talk about the risk of a particular molecular, uh, of, of a particular mutation that we give along with it. There would be a drug response analysis that we give. We'll talk about the chances that a patient responds to a certain drug. We may be talking about a survival analysis, all this in one radiology report. And, and this is what I meant by the more the amount of data there is, the more expertise that is needed because all this would come with their own artifacts, um, which is the biases, which is something that we all need to actually be trained at picking up um, rather than thinking of them as something, as something that is very objective that's just going to come out printed from the uh, computer. So our, our task is actually becoming even more complex than it was in the past. Um, in fact, um, a lot of applications actually talk about how you can translate to other modalities. For example, given a CT, 
you can actually synthetically generate a PET, you can actually synthetically generate an MR, uh, again, adding to the whole complexity of the analysis you, that you're giving. And finally, you can perhaps using techniques like natural language processing, actually start giving out reports uh, that are meant for different people. There will be a conventional report, and then there'll be a patient report, which is explaining things to him in a simple, understandable language. Then there can be a surgeon report where you're actually pointing out to the abnormality. Um, so, so should suffice to say that AI is actually increasing the complexity of things far beyond we're actually looking at it right now. And um, does this really provide yet another opportunity? Like uh, Dr. Manisha Bahal, Bahal had pointed out, uh, perhaps there could be a chance that we get auto-generated reports. We are moving in the direction where uh, there could be pre-filled reports which are readily available. So the patient undergoes an investigation and comes out. And as a radiologist, we don't need to spend time actually typing out this report or dictating this report. And what this allows for is an opportunity to actually meet the patient. And perhaps this is the opportunity that radiology has always been looking for. Um, we have already always moved and worked beh behind the curtains. But imagine a situation where you are the patient, wouldn't you want to meet the radiologist? Wouldn't you want to really understand what are the chances that, uh, that you have a malignancy? What are the, how, how sure is the radiologist of the fact that you have a malignancy? Uh, it truly actually brings about a real possibility where you can actually discuss things with the patient before actually giving out a report. Uh, this is one example from our own work. We presented this in RSNA 2020, where if you look at all of these mammograms, they actually all have the same cancer. If I had to point out to the cancer in each one of these, here is the cancer. Uh, apart from the first one, all the others are actually synthetically generated mammograms using a technique called gen generative adversarial networks. And uh, what we've tried to do over here is give the user um, uh, an ability to generate mammograms with different distributions of fibroglandular tissue, with different densities, different sizes, as we can see over here, and blend in masses in a very realistic way. Uh, and, and this we've used for medical education, where we trained residents, um, we gave the simulation training to residents. Um, this was a pilot study that we presented, but there is a more elaborate study that's currently going on in the department. And what we found is that it was much, it was a very quick way of training residents because it would take them very long and they probably will not see all these examples uh, during their routine course of training. So um, this is an example of where AI goes beyond the routine detection, um, where it's actually helping you train and moving forward, um, maybe improving the quality in more ways than, uh, than we've looked at uh, in the present. There is a huge problem of how to regulate and when to give a clinical license to a tool. Is a prospective study really enough? And how big should this prospective study be before we can judge whether an AI algorithm is doing its job? How much information do companies really need to release about the AI algorithm? Because they can't release all the information, but we do know that, uh, that this information has significant implications on what kind of patients it would work on and what kind of patients it would not work on. So where is that fine balance? Because the company would not be viable if everything was to be open source. Um, and then lastly, how do we confirm findings which are not visible to the human eye? For example, the example that we showed in COVID pneumonia. Um, if, if there's something where I as a human being cannot really confirm with my eyes as a radiologist, how do we uh, believe and how do we integrate the system into clinical practice? Uh, which actually brings us to how do we improve the uh, reliability of such a system. And um, this is some of our own work through which I want to uh, sort of emphasize why it's important for radiologists to actually be a part of the development, uh, not only a part of the annotation, uh, not only a part of the validation, but also a core part of the network development uh, required for AI. Our first version of the tool that we tried developing for uh, cancer detection on mammogram was a standard object detection network, which was used in, na in, in natural, uh, natural images. So we did obtain great numbers, but what we also realized was that it ended up missing some very large masses because we had trained this on public data sets and the network was not used to seeing the kind of huge masses that we got um, in our practice in India. It also missed small architectural distortions 
uh, as well as many microcalcifications. And this is because uh, most standard object detection networks actually significantly reduce the size of the image when they take it as input. Um, and, and as radiologists, as breast radiologists, we know how important the resolution is specifically in case of mammography. Uh, we also realized that it ended up missing obscure masses. And given the number of dense breasts we get in India, the, the number of um, isodense masses as a result of that, uh, this was very important for the Indian population given the higher breast density that we get. So we incorporated algorithms specifically for dense breasts and obscure masses. We incorporated high resolution into it. Uh, we incorporated opposite view information and opposite breast information because we as breast radiologists, again, know the importance of looking at the opposite breast or the, um, or the contralateral view. Uh, but, uh, and, and all of these are actually under review currently. But um, this is just to share how important it is to actually be a part of the development process itself. And as I end, I just wanted to end with this slide. Uh, this is my daughter here. Um, and uh, I was very fortunate to actually foray into artificial intelligence at about the same time as she was born. So I had this unique opportunity of watching how human vision develops versus how artificial intelligence and computer vision develops. Uh, what I found very interesting is that she'd already always seen Ganesh Ji, sorry, as, um, as, as, as this in one form as this, and she'd never seen sketches before. But the first time she actually saw two sketches, she instantly knew that this is Ganesh Ji and this is an elephant. And this um, ability to translate into other domains, this ability to think beyond um, what you are actually just shown is what makes human beings um, unique as they are. And, and that is really the message that I'd want to leave you with. With that, I'd like to thank you all for your attention and thanks to the organizers for giving me this opportunity. Thank you, Kritika. That was really, really wonderful. I think it went beyond the domain of science and radiology into uh, uh, psychology, religion, uh, a whole lot. And I think it's very important. And I really liked your, um, uh, your message of don't you need a pilot in the cockpit? I think that that's, that's something we really need to uh, understand. And your point about uh, the fact that the more data the cre we create, things become actually more complicated than what we think. So, you know, we are uh, always will be required uh, despite all, you know, the computers and things. And I think this, this is just something which I just remember from history. I mean, some, uh, I believe when the printing press was first discovered, people thought uh, teachers would go out, there'll be no teachers because everything's available in print, but that didn't happen. When the computer age uh, came and people uh, believed uh, uh, there'd be no more teachers, everything would be on the computer. So uh, there's, a, 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 there's a lot of history behind this. And as you said, uh, you know, the excitement and the trough, and then you come back to reality. So uh, we are still in that uh, stage where we've not reached the reality of AI in uh, in uh, radiology and breast imaging in particular, but with all this input, I'm sure we will. Yeah. And I think now without much ado, we'll go on to the panel discussion so we can take any questions which came, came in for Kritika during the panel discussion. And I have uh, the, uh, the great opportunity of uh, introducing our moderator for today's panel discussion. This is Dr. Vimal Raj. He is the chief of cardiothoracic imaging at uh, Narayana Health. He's a very close friend of mine. Uh, and uh, his interests vary, like all of yours, you know, very uh, over a great domain. You know, it's not just cardiothoracic imaging for, for him. He's into management, he's into AI, he's into uh, health care. And uh, uh, he, he basically belongs, of course, uh, to Karnataka, but did his most of his training in the UK. And I'm very proud to have Major Vimal Raj with us. He worked with the British Army and was deployed in the war zone of Afghanistan. So I think Vimal has seen more life really in uh, than all of us put together. It's a great uh, pleasure to have you with us, Vimal. And I'd like to, to take over the uh, panel discussion. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Rupa. Uh, excellent talks by everybody. Really enjoyed it. As I said, uh, 
not a domain expert when it comes to breast imaging, but certainly uh, I remember my days uh, about 20 years ago when I had to go through the UK NHS breast screening mammograms. The cringe in my face was very evident when we had to, you know, we had those roller balls of x-rays loaded up together and we had to keep pressing and the new x-rays would come down. And the technology has changed so far in these years and it's really amazing to see what the potential holds. Uh, I would like Dr. Smriti also to, if you can please switch on the your camera because uh, I would like to start by asking some questions to you. I would also like to invite Hari uh, to join onto the panel. Hari is uh, the uh, brain behind this program and also a uh, engineer who is into artificial intelligence and machine learning uh, from the CHS, the corporeal uh, solutions, and I'm going to ask him also some questions. Uh, Dr. Smriti, are you there? Uh, if you're there, I can start with you. Yes, perfect. She's there. Dr. Smriti, any personal experience with regards to using AI in your workplace in India? What do you think? What has been your experience? Uh, Kritika is, uh, is uh, been working on two indigenous kind of AI uh, softwares and uh, which we are trying to integrate into our packs and help us with reporting. So uh, it is not yet fully functional, but we are uh, halfway there. And uh, what we are using is the, uh, the AI for resident training. And that is proving very useful because uh, uh, the residents are, you know, enabled to simulate uh, density and play around with the mass and put them in their different locations to train themselves. And we do a pre and post uh, testing, which has uh, really shown clear improvement. So I'm really looking forward to the use of AI uh, in my institute in the coming times with Kritika at the helm of things. I think uh, the example that Kritika showed about the RSNA was a fantastic example of, you know, showing synthetic uh, mammals, showing different lesions. And especially if you're in a training screen where you do not necessarily tend to get these many cases of pathologies, it's a fantastic opportunity for people to learn. Dr. Manisha, you, you were talking that because a lot of this is in 2D space and uh, the AI platforms, you do not have that much of usage of this. Uh, in your institution, let's say somebody comes up with a software and says, hey, this is great software. Can you guys use it? Do you have a algorithm or do you have a stepwise approach before you will take up any such uh, products into practice? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, we don't have a very organized, um, you know, organized um, approach to assessment yet. Um, there's quite a bit of, uh, you know, regulatory approval needed before it can be used clinically. Um, and as I mentioned, there are currently 18, you know, commercial algorithms. So I do have some experience working with algorithms from a research perspective, but uh, I have not used any of the lesion diagnosis and detection algorithms um, in, in the clinical setting yet. Uh, my brother um, is also a radiologist. He practices in California. And I know that his practice uh, recently adopted an AI algorithm for lung nodule detection on chest CT. And uh, the way that they have implemented in their practice is um, the chest CTs are read as part of routine clinical care by the radiologists. And then after they're read, they're run through the AI system. And then a small committee goes through any discrepancies between the AI system and the radiologist reader and can potentially send you know, the report back to the radiologist for an addendum if there's something clinically significant. But the goal is very much to test you know, the system before they roll it out everywhere. If they find that the AI system isn't actually detecting clinically significant findings, they you know, wouldn't make an investment into such an expensive technology. So I think that is, um, that's a good template as an, as an approach before rolling, rolling out an algorithm across clinical practice. Excellent. Uh, for people who are attending, if you guys have any questions to the panelists, please feel free to put in the chat box and I will post the questions on your behalf and the panelists as well. If you've got any burning questions for each other, please 
feel free to ask. Uh, Kritika, one uh, very interesting uh, talk of yours. I really enjoyed it thoroughly. And uh, this is the simple thing I remember the way I correlated, you know, as soon as you uh, pass your 12th standard and you think you've got a good rank, you become an MBBS seat, you feel you're happy of becoming a doctor, and then you realize you have to read so much. You finish your doctor and you think, yes, I'm a doctor, great. And then there's postgraduate exams and it just never keeps ending in there. And uh, same thing is with technology. New technology comes, we have something newer in that technology. But what interested me in your talk is who is actually responsible at the end of it all? Who is actually culpable for this? Fast forward ourselves to, let's say, 2027, five years or six years from now. What do you think will become the legal responsibility and where do you think the legal responsibility of such an algorithm will lie with? So, so that's an incredible question because I think that's what we are all struggling with. I mean, perhaps uh, when we look in terms of numbers, uh, perhaps AI performs very well, but, um, but that does not necessarily uh, sort of absolve it of all the responsibility. Um, uh, although, so, 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 so I think uh, that's perhaps one of the reasons why um, the radiologist has to stay. So it would, in all likelihood, how I see it is that it would basically become like a plugin that is sold along with, say, all the readers. So it will probably be something that's sold along with a Singovia or a GE reader. And um, um, so, so they have their inbuilt algorithms that you can use, you're free to use to assist you. But the buck will always stop with the radiologist. I don't believe that we will get to a stage where um, where, where we can hold the technology responsible for not detecting something. Uh, I don't believe we're there yet. And as a corollary to that, see, if, when we look at the uh, technology currently in India, the medical devices policy does not necessarily get considered as a medical device. So we do not have an FDA, we do not have a CE mark before these products can be actually marketed. Uh, what do you think about that? Uh, so, so I think quality assurance is essentially a problem in India when it comes to everything. Like uh, Professor Smithiari was also pointing out, uh, the problem with mammography has also been that you have uh, the, the quality of some studies that come to us are also so impossible to read. So, so that's actually true um, all along. Um, I mean, when it comes to modalities, when it comes to um, uh, to reading. Uh, but we do, this is, this is an urgent need that we have as a country. We need to sort of get our quality assurances in place before we can roll out a new technology, which is as powerful as AI. Uh, it is liable to be horribly misused without such quality assurance. That's correct. Dr. Manisha, any inputs on that? I presume you would not touch anything which doesn't have an FDA approval. Yes, that's correct. Only for, you know, research purposes would... Um... Could we, could we use any other algorithm? They're, they're quite strict regulations. Um, but I, I agree with Dr. Kritika that um, liability, I think, will ultimately fall upon the, upon the radiologist, um, upon the radiologist reader. I think we're quite, um, I, um, having, uh, you know, AI, a standalone interpretation without radiologist involvement, I think is in the far distant future, all of the studies to this point have shown that best performance is, is achieved by the machine and radiologists working together. Um, I also think there's a lot of um, uh, distrust you know, among the community and patients about allowing uh, machines to make decisions without any, any human involvement. Uh, so since you know, radiologists will continue to be involved in interpretation, I think that liability will ultimately be there. Dr. Rupa, any comments about the liability? What do you think is likely to be the future? You're on mute. Yes, yeah. yeah. Uh, that, that's, that's a very important question. And uh, that's why I do not foresee uh, a future where uh, AI will take over the reporting. Yeah, because the liability has to stop us and AI cannot take that uh, responsibility and, and, and patients would not want that either, isn't it? We've seen that. They, they do not want to be read by a computer and uh, they do not want to be read by something or someone who is not liable at all. 
So I don't think that, that there would be no trust. So what I would foresee, particularly in a country like India, is where, uh, uh, you know, as you said, uh, the, the, the imaging is heterogeneous and the reporting is also heterogeneous. So if we could get some way of uh, doing a large number of mammograms, say like in a mobile van or something like this, and we could get AI to look at these images, and uh, again, uh, sort of categorize them as the highest possibility of cancer and the less possibility of cancer. And we could have a system where the ones which are really are likely to have a cancer go immediately for reporting, while the others can be, you know, sort of validated later. I mean, that's the sort of scenario I would look at uh, AI doing in a country like India, where we have a large population, uh, we have pockets of excellence, but, you know, we've pockets of uh, a poor representation in between. So th that's the way I would look at AI uh, helping us. And uh, as you said, because we cannot, uh, you know, uh, put a case against uh, an, an AI or a medical legal negligence cannot be uh, think against them, um, the radiologist would have to take center stage and use AI as a tool to improve efficiency and to improve a cancer detection and also probably to uh, uh, reduce their false positives. Thank you. Uh, there's a question from Dr. Shabnam, who is a breast and a colorectal cancer surgeon, uh, also trained in robotics. And uh, their question is that they would like to stay updated. And if there are very similar to what was asked to Dr. Manisha earlier, if there are any short certification courses available in AI and machine learning, I was speaking with Hari. Hari, do you have any updates on this, something where people can improve their knowledge or learn something about AI and machine learning? Uh, this is something, thanks, Vimal. Uh, this is something we are also working on. We realize one of the key things uh, when we speak to most of the radiologists, uh, the one key thing is they read an AI-driven results, possibly. When they read an image along with an AI, is something which is something new to them. And we are also trying to come up with a course which could help them to understand with the certification, which could potentially give them a way where they can understand how to read an AI-driven images. That's something we are closely working on. They should be available sooner to them. They can stay in touch. So one of the points which Dr. Kritika made, which I think was very important, is the radiologists need to be a part of the building process of any machine learning algorithm, not just the annotation or uh, testing of it, but need to be an ingrained part of this. What has been your experience of developing such a system in India? Do you feel you get enough support from uh, radiologists and clinicians to do this? Uh, to be honest, thanks for you to start off with. That's why we started working along too. So there are some good radiologists which we have worked closely who understands the technology, who understands it is going to be an aiding tool. And one of the key things the radiologist tries to help us is to make us understand it's an aiding tool per se. And their knowledge transfer uh, plays a huge role away from annotations or testing is to make us understand what it is first. Uh, to be honest, a developer like us, we don't even understand what is this image all about. It looks like a, a rocket science to us when we see the image for the first time. And then for a radiologist to come back and make us to realize what it is and what it is not is a big thing. Uh, to take a mammogram for a right example, uh, sometimes we see an image, it, does, it looks very clean for us when I started off reading a mammogram image, we thought, oh, it's it's a very clean image. But once I started sitting with the radiologist team, I understand this is where the abnormalities are. For us, we thought uh, a lesions as a large abnormalities. So whatever lesions is what an AI is supposed to do. Then we went deep into it and we were able to pick a lot of information. The poor information that I find from a radiologist to help develop a product is to make us understand what to see in an image. That is the most critical part first. Uh, I'd like to bring it to her. Excellent. I think uh, in the interest of time, uh, I'm going to stop there. Uh, I'm just going to, uh, out of, just out of interest, okay, just thinking out of the box, you know, the conspiracy theories uh, that people talk about, what can happen to these images, and looking at Dr. Kritika's images of artificially showing cancers and stuff. Is that something of the reality where we talk about bio warfare coming up? There could be a 
you know, artificially. Uh, I've seen a lot of these images. I think there was a couple of publications where lesions which were not there were made to be appeared in there. And the issue happens is going back and a human detection of this itself as an abnormal becomes very difficult. Uh, Dr. Kritika, do we need to be worried about or do you think I'm getting paranoid as I get old? No, actually, uh, I, I think that's a very true concern. Uh, so so, so that there are these adversarial attacks that can happen. Um, so, so, so researchers have seen that even if you add like these, this of course was intentionally generated the way they were, but um, they've seen that even if you add noise um, in a certain way, which is actually undetectable to the human eye. So there's no way I would say that this, this particular image has been altered, but it does alter the uh, prediction of an AI algorithm. So, so that is something of great concern actually. And um, that's something though that, that we are, um, that, that there is a lot of active research going on on to detecting and removing such adversarial attacks. But again, uh, so, 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 so the, this just adds to the complexity of why AI uh, cannot be led to sort of function on its own, at least at the moment. We need to sort out, this is one of the very important problems that we definitely need to sort out before it can come into clinical practice. Uh, Dr. Manisha, any last words, any parting words on this regard? Uh, yeah, that's an interesting question. I've read some articles about these adversarial attacks, but um, uh, don't have personal experience. A lot of the research that I do is done in collaboration with technical experts at MIT. Uh, so we have our group of, you know, domain experts like myself at Mass General, and we work closely with the technical experts. So I will rely on their um, knowledge and expertise to help us with um, those types of technical, you know, issues if they, they arise. Excellent. Uh, thank you very much for everybody. And uh, I take this opportunity now to invite Dr. Rupa again, uh, who's going to share with us her experience uh, of uh, using an AI platform, an AI algorithm in her clinical practice, and what has been her experience on that. Uh, thank you very much to all the panelists again, and over to you, Dr. Rupa. Uh, thank you, uh, Vimal, and thank you all for those that wonderful uh, panel discussion we had. Uh, and I'll just take a few minutes of your time to uh, show us, uh, show you what we have done uh, from down south in India. So this is just glimpses from the south. And uh, Dr. Rupa, just one second. Sorry, we are seeing your screen, but we are not seeing any PowerPoint presentation. Or any presentation. Your screen sharing is paused. One minute. Stop share. But I th okay, just a minute. Stop share. Okay. I'll go back to share screen. Right. Can you see it now? Yes, we can now. Yes, fine. Right. I'll go to slideshow. Can you see it now? Yes, it's working. Yes. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Okay. So this is a small project, uh, a group of us from Manipal Hospital in Bangalore uh, did uh, together with Hari and his group. Uh, so uh, the, the reason for us joining into this is we also, re as uh, most of us Indians, Indian radiologists and Indian doctors realize that healthcare systems in developing countries are heterogeneous in their capabilities. And uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning systems will help us to make better diagnosis, will help us to make more diagnosis, will help us to actually treat more people. But uh, many of these algorithms from developed countries are very uh, expensive and probably not adaptable to local practices. Uh, so that's why we decided to get involved in this AI program. And we also realized that breast cancer screening programs, and particularly in developing countries, are not well established. There is a variable competency of radiologists in interpreting mammography. We are a huge country. We do have an increasing number of breast cancers uh, in our country, and most of our uh, 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 
one in two patients uh, who are diagnosed with breast cancer actually die in our country of that disease. And most of it is because of a delayed diagnosis. So will AI help us in making this early diagnosis? Will it help us save lives? And that's why we got involved in this project. Okay, so uh, we uh, went about to assess the performance of an indigenously built uh, AI application in reporting mammographic uh, uh, images in a developing country. So this indigenously built uh, AI system performs well, both with CR and DR. It was a supervised machine learning, uh, deep learning, and the training data set was of 9,960 cases. And this is just a, a, a training flow chart, which we used. So mammographic images from a tertiary referral center, which is our center and a teleradiology unit, which caters to numerous institutes were collated between November uh, 2018 to February to, uh, 2020. The images were divided into training and testing data sets. And the training data set was annotated by a team of senior radiologists, which included me too. Uh, the AI system, we initially just were trying to train it uh, to highlight any abnormal findings. So just look for benign and malignant. That was our initial uh, goal. Uh, so cases uh, from the testing data set were again report, re-reported by uh, four radiologists and assessed together with the AI generated report. And any discrepancy between the radiologist and the AI report was then re-reported by a senior radiologist and a consensus opinion was generated, okay? So a uh, total amount, uh, a total a number of cases was about 18,908. Uh, the training set consisted of 53% of that, which is about 9,960. And of the testing set, uh, 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 randomly selected 3,042 cases were reported by the radiologists and 23% of the case which is uh, reported by the radiologists were actually computed CR images, which is a common, uh, which we, we took in because a large amount of mammographic images are still CR in our country. So the accuracy of this, uh, this indigenously built system was 95% in differentiating normal from abnormal. So the sensitivity was 98% and the specificity was about 94. The commonest false positive findings we found was uh, axillary lymph nodes. Uh, uh, AI picked up a lot of axillary lymph nodes and most of you who are practicing in India will know that axillary lymph nodes are very common in our country and pseudomasses due to overlapping tissue. Okay, so this is just an example of a pseudomass which was uh, annotated by the uh, the uh, AI machine and you can see that's just actually an uh, a nipple, which was not in profile, and sometimes overlapping tissue, which is diagnosed as focal asymmetry. So this was a focal asymmetry on a DR, and that was a focal asymmetry on a CR image, which was seen only on one view and was annotated by the uh, AI. And uh, being a radiologist and looking at the other view, we knew that was really not pathology. Okay, The commonest False uh, negative findings, which is very important, microcalcifications, Kritika spoke about that. We found a lot of microcalcifications were actually missed uh, or not annotated by the mammography um, uh, AI uh, device. Uh, focal asymmetries were sometimes missed, sometimes overdiagnosed. Masses which were obscured by dense tissue. Multiple lesions where AI would pick up some but not the others. Subtle architectural distortion, uh, Kritika spoke about that too. And some diffuse changes. We found it that it, it didn't pick up, you know, it, like it didn't pick up large masses. It didn't pick up sometimes diffuse changes like skin changes or parenchymal thickening, okay? So uh, that was a, a, a retro areolar mass, uh, just under the nipple, which uh, it didn't pick up. This was a diffuse change. You can see the parenchymal uh, thickening, the skin thickening, that was not annotated by uh, AI. And microcalcification, so it picked up the, the mass, but it didn't pick up the associated microcalcification. And in multiple lesions, so it, sometimes it annotated this, but it didn't pick up the smaller uh, uh, satellite nodule over there. So just going quickly to the classification of errors as uh, reported by AI and uh, uh, by ML, we found there were four types of errors. 
One of the course was the technologically related uh, errors. Uh, you know, in CR, you would get screen artifacts and scratches, which sometimes could be uh, falsely uh, annotated. Okay. Technical uh, related uh, 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 errors, which AI missed, and that would be sometimes your patient positioning. So it could be a skin fold, or it could be a nipple, which is not in profile. That was technical, which the AI did not recognize as a technical uh, error or an artifact actually annotated. Uh, Sometimes because of patient positioning, actually, the cancer was not well imaged, particularly in one view. There was a compression, so it was not well seen. So those are the technically related uh, issues we had. Patient-related issues, of course, the dense breast, which are mass patients, okay, or it creates false lesions. Uh, patient-related, again, depending upon the population pool, uh, we had uh, also in the form of uh, uh, axillary uh, lymph nodes, which are actually uh, annotated by AI as uh, suggesting cancer. Then AI-related uh, issues, which include uh, that of perception and interpretation. And as I said, some of the false negatives of which we found were when they were diffuse changes, AI yeah, didn't pick them up, subtle changes, subtle architectural distortion, subtle microcalcification or when there were multiple lesions, which were important from a, a surgical point of view to pick up all the lesions, AI would just pick up the most obvious one, more subtle changes, okay? Uh, so our conclusions were that uh, the indigenously AI algorithm, uh, I think somebody has to mute themselves. There's a lot of uh, noise in the background, okay? The indigenously built AI algorithm has promising results with high sensitivity and high specificity in this large data a set, but further modifications are definitely required. We have to reduce false negatives. That's very important. We have to distinguish between benign and malignant lesions. So it's not just sufficient to say that there is an abnormality. You have to tell uh, you the AI has to indicate whether it's benign, malignant, whether it needs treatment. And also probably we have to train the AI to actually categorize the lesion as virads. So this uh, study was uh, accepted as a paper presentation uh, in uh, ECR 2020. And uh, we use this data set also to assess the impact of AI mammography reporting on radiology turnaround time and to assess the relationship of the same with radiology experience, okay? So four radiologists with differing levels of experience were monitored uh, during uh, mammography reporting. And what was assessed was the time taken to analyze each mammography uh, image, the number of cases reported per hour, and the years of radiology experience of each reader was uh, A was less than two years, B was two to four, C was four to eight, and D was more than eight years of experience in uh, reporting mammograms. Okay? And after a gap of four weeks, the same cases were uh, presented to the respective radiologists along with the AI and the ML inputs. And now again, uh, the same uh, uh, parameters were assessed, the time to report each case and the number of cases reported in an hour and the results were uh, compared and what we found is uh, again we did uh, 3000 cases were reported among four radiologists including both screening and symptomatic patients without ai uh, the time taken to report a case uh, was about six minutes with a range of about four to six minutes with AI, that dropped to four minutes, okay? Uh, I know uh, as uh, com compared to standards um, in the West where mammography is reported much more quicker, this is a longer time, but this is the average time we do it in India. And uh, the number of cases w uh, w uh, which a radiologist would report without AI in one hour is about 10.7, and that increased to 15.5 with the help of AI. And so overall, there was a 47% uh, improvement in uh, turnaround time for reporting mammography with the aid of AI than without AI. And uh, looking at the years of experience, you could find that there was no, actually, we didn't really find a significant variation in improvement of that based on years of experience.
So uh, uh, this conclusion of this study was uh, AI assisted mammographic reading has a significant impact on radiologists turnaround time and this improved efficiency is seen irrespective of years of experience. Uh, so this was uh, presented at uh, RSNA 2020. To summarize, I would like to say that uh, as the others uh, readers have uh, other speakers have said artificial intelligence and machine learning has proven their utility uh, and as being incorporated into routine clinical practice uh, ai and ml systems are not 100 percent accurate they can generate false positive or false negative uh, findings and actually they can miss big elephants big masses so that's why the radiologists are really uh, needed around but uh, ai systems really can i feel improve efficiency in reporting we done a, a, a small study showing how it reduces tat time so i think it's very important to have a systematic approach in reviewing ai ml generated mammographic reports maybe we need ai to put the most uh, 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 suspicious mammography uh, on the top of our list or uh, need them to be on our list first so we uh, uh, assess those first um, uh, we need probably ai as a second reader uh, we need ai to improve our efficiency and our chat time so uh, in conclusion uh, as the other readers said uh, speaker said what i'd like to say is ai is here to aid but not replace us thank you thank you from uh, corporeal health solutions and the department of radiology manipal hospital thank you uh, any questions to dr rupa I'll see if there's anything okay. in the box. Okay, fine. No. no fine. Uh, okay. So, shall we invite uh, Hari to give his yes, closing I remarks, think, Dr. Uh, Rupa? And before I just, I just really like to thank uh, uh, all the speakers uh, here today. You've uh, shed a lot of light, not only from the technological point of view, but radiological point of view, but uh, an overview of. Uh, uh, not only AI in mammography, but AI in imaging in general. So I think uh, all of us do realize that AI is here to stay and we have to use AI uh, in the way uh, which will help us the best. Uh, so once again, uh, thank you all, all the speakers for being uh, with us on this Saturday evening and over to you, Hari. Thank you, doctor. Doctor, you have to... Uh... Exit, I think uh, you're still sharing your screen. Stop share. Sorry. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you for the uh, thank you all the guest spe guest speakers for helping us. And uh, it was a really, really uh, good discussions. And uh, as a developer, I, I came to know a lot about uh, AI and imaging per se. Like I had a lot of information that could help us to go forward from here. And thanks all that needs for turning up and Breast Imaging Society India. Thanks for uh, supporting us and collaborating us with this with this uh, seminar. I'd like to give a small takeaway for everybody. Like uh, we would love to give free trial of our software, uh, AI and mammogram for all the attendees here. They can turn up and they can log in into our website chs.world or they can just send us an email to sales at chs.world and we'll be happy to give a free trial version to everyone. And looking forward to talk to you all speakers in future too. Thank you. Ari, how can they reach you? Uh, they can reach me in contact at chs.world or sales at chs.world. They can just send an email to us. And we have all the attendees email ID along with us. So we will be happy to send them an email also along with us. Thank you. Yeah, I okay. think maybe you can send the email uh, to all the attendees, uh, Hari, eh? because uh, probably most of them have not got the, uh, uh, the email ID. So you can just send your uh, email ID to most of them. And I've, I've seen a lot of uh, uh, people who actually asking for a recording mm -hmm. of this session. Maybe they haven't, uh, you know, seen the whole thing and they'd like to listen to it again. Uh, so probably we could uh, try to um, uh, see how we can help people who want to see the recording again. Yes, I will send a YouTube link of the recording in the same email thread. Okay, thank you.
Thank you. So once again, uh, thank you all. Thank you, Hari. Thank you, Vimal. Uh, thank you, Manisha, Kritika, and Smriti for uh, your wonderful inputs. Uh, good night and have a good weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Rupa. And thank you, everybody, for sparing the time on Saturday evening. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you.